Touchdown! 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 The Bills make me wanna shout. Kick your heels up and shout. Throw your hands up and shout. Throw your head back and shout. But come on now, the Bills are making it happen now. Stand up now, come on and shout. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shout it right. Bills fanatics, welcome back to the Buffalo Fanatics podcast. I am your host, Fern Banatine, as always, and you can reach me on Twitter at at FBanaty, that's at F-B-A-N-N-A-T-Y, or if you want to talk about this week's podcast, you can also do so in the comments section. I will be looking through the comments and hoping to engage with you. Kickoff to the first game of the Buffalo Bills 2019 season is now only days away feel like we've all been waiting for this all summer and since the season is finally here I'd like to introduce you to a rebrand of this podcast which we've been calling the Buffalo Fanatics podcast. It's been one of a number of great podcasts across the Buffalo Fanatics brand but we're, what we're going to do is we're going to call this podcast the Build Up podcast from now on. And what I mean by the build-up is that I am going to spend my time here on this podcast getting you ready for our upcoming game. We will talk about what we should expect from the opponent and talk about a few keys to victory every week. I'll also talk about any interesting storylines, maybe some potential fantasy advice and implications. And then what I'd like to do is finish off with a predicted score. So let's have some fun during the 2019 season. Again, kickoff is only hours away now, and that's tomorrow, Sunday, September 8th, when our Buffalo Bills travel to MetLife Stadium to take on the New York Jets, a division rival, a very key matchup already early in the season. And the weather is looking perfect for opening day. It is going to be approximately 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21 degrees Celsius for those in Canada. And it looks like it's going to be a game against two relatively even matched teams. The New York Jets are favored by essentially what you get for being the home team, about three points. So the Vegas odds makers believe these two teams are very even. And it looks like the Bills starting lineup is relatively set at this point. Uh, Still waiting for some injury news to shake out. We will talk about this over the course of the show. But let's quickly go over the 2019 Buffalo Bills starting lineup for opening day. Actually, I heard something very interesting today. It was pointed out to me that the Buffalo Bills have only one returning starter on offense this year across the whole offense. That's Deion Dawkins, our left tackle. But otherwise, it is 10 new starters across the board. Of course, Josh Allen did come in and start pretty quickly early in last season after the Nate Peterman failure. And I think in some formations, you can say that Zay Jones is still a starter in three wide receiver sets. But for the most part, we have a drastically different offense going into this season. So if we look at the starters on offense, a quarterback, of course, will be second year player Josh Allen. Our starting running back should be Frank Gore, although we expect Devin Singletary to get action early and often. And I think I do want to touch on the LaShawn McCoy release that happened this past Saturday on cutdown day. Now, I've been talking throughout the summer about how I think that Sean LaCoy may be a cutdown candidate, uh, just given his contract and given the fact that we did bring in Devin Singletary in the third round of the draft and then TJ Yeldon. uh, I did think it would make sense that if LaShawn McCoy didn't demonstrate to the front office and coaching staff that he bounced back to his form previous to last year. Uh, He may be a cut down candidate, but I am certainly not content or satisfied with the fact that he was released and I'm not really pinning it on the coaching staff or the front office. I think it's more so that he didn't show that that he was going to bounce back to form for the decision makers to decide to keep him around and they probably decided from all angles that it was time to roll with the combination currently on the team. Uh, But what gets to me is that uh, I was clearly hoping on him bouncing back to form and I thought that was going to be a key element to us having success this year. Uh, Having a dynamic running back back there, I think it would have really helped Josh Allen with his development, just having a bit more of a balanced attack. Now that's not to say that Devin Singletary can't be that guy, Uh, it's just a little more uncertainty at this point. I think we know what we get with Frank Gore, he's you know your 3.7 yards per carry and a cloud of dust type running back. 
He certainly could play an important role, but he's not going to be a game breaker. So no matter which way you slice it, we're probably a little bit, at least right now, we're a little bit of a worse off team. And that's a big deal if we're heading into this season where we expect to contend closely for a playoff spot. So I think the running back situation has me a little bit concerned, uh, but that can change very quickly if Devin Singletary really shows that the tape he showed in college does transfer to the NFL level. He was an excellent dynamic running back. It looked a lot like Michonne McCoy with that one cut ability out there in college. Didn't test so well, so I wanted to see what the juxtaposition was going to be between him not testing well, uh, him demonstrating good tape. I think we're going to find out fairly early if Devin Singletary is going to be a dynamic contributor this year. And I think it's going to be a big deal for this football team. So let's wait and see what happens there. So after the starting running back, we have Patrick DeMarco as our starting fullback. Uh, the wide receivers, when we go with three wide receiver sets, it looks like it's going to be John Brown and Zay Jones outside and Cole Beasley in the slot. And then at tight end, it looks like Tyler Croft has an outside shot at returning and starting. He's listed as our starter for now. now. That would be a bit of a good news story. I think he's probably an upgrade over all of the other tight ends on the roster. Uh, still probably a bit of an outside shot that he plays, but that would be nice to see. And if not, I don't think it's a big downgrade if we go down to someone like, say, Jason Kroom, who had some flashes last year. And then we move to offensive line. I don't think this has been formalized yet, but I think we have a pretty good idea um, uh, from what we're seeing on death charts at this point, who the Buffalo Bills starting five are going to be. Again, it looks like Deion Dawkins is going to be our left tackle starter. Then the rest of the offensive line is going to be Quinton Spain at left guard, Mitch Morse at center, John Feliciano at right guard, and Cody Ford at right tackle. And we'll have to keep a close eye on Ford to see if he can continue to improve as he has during the preseason and I think there's a lot of different combinations that we could have used out there but I'm pretty happy with this starting five I think this is our probably the position where we have the biggest upgrade over last year and that should help the running game as well so we'll keep a close eye on how well that offensive line performs and then on the defensive side of the ball we have last year's starters Jerry Hughes and Trent Murphy at the defensive end positions our new rookie defensive three technique will be Ed Oliver starting. Starla Tulele will man the one technique. Our middle linebacker is Tremaine Edmonds. And then on the weak side, we have Matt Bellano returning. And on the strong side, we have our veteran leader, Lorenzo Alexander, returning. And in the secondary, the two starting cornerbacks that ended last year in Tredavious White and Levi Wallace will return as starters. And as well at safety, we have two firmly entrenched starters who have been difference makers the last few years in Mika Hyde and Jordan Poye returning as starters. In the kicking game, we have re newly re-signed Stephen Hoshka as our kicker. We're hoping he bounces back. And then probably our sore spot is that punting position where we're still rolling out with Corey Baroques. Apparently he's looked good in practice this week, so fingers crossed that he can turn things around early in the season as quickly as possible. We're going to talk about our punting situation and the special teams as a whole when we discuss the three keys to victory this game a little later in this podcast. But first, let's turn our attention to a bit of an overview of the New York Jets team that we face in week one. Now, to me, the Jets are on a very similar trajectory as the Buffalo Bills. Like the Buffalo Bills in 2017, they drafted what they hoped to be their franchise quarterback in Sam Darnold out of USC. Darnold was a quarterback I was very high on coming out of the 2018 draft. I think I had a, him and Baker Mayfield 1A and 1B in my pre-draft rankings. Uh, he had a very strong 2016 season for USC. Uh, really made a name for himself with a fantastic performance in the Rose Bowl that year. Then in 2017, he struggled a little with turnovers. I don't think his offensive line was as strong that year. And then coming into the NFL in his rookie season, Darnold had his struggles early on, which is, I guess, to be expected. We saw lots of turnovers early on based mostly on bad decisions. We all know how that feels. But Darnold really started to turn the corner that last four-game stretch of the season. He was one of the highest-ranked quarterbacks according to PFF. During that four-game stretch, he threw six touchdown passes to only one interception. And the Jets are hopeful that he maintains this ascension and he brings that into this season. 
like the Bills, the Jets are banking on him developing into a franchise quarterback and leading them to a perennial contender status over the next few years to come. Now, also similar to the Bills, uh, the Jets went out this offseason and made it a priority to uh, strengthen that offensive line. In the offseason, they made a trade to bring over offensive guard Kalichi Osemele from the Oakland Raiders. They also brought Ryan Khalil out of retirement to anchor the center position for them. Through the draft, they brought in Chuma Idoga, who is Sam Darnold's left tackle at USC. He'll be brought along slowly to hopefully take over one of those tackle positions in years to come. And then, insofar as weapons, well, of course, they brought over a premier running back in this league in Le'Veon Bell, a jack-of-all-trades, if you will. We'll talk more about Le'Veon Bell's potential effects in this upcoming game a little later. And then on the defensive side of the ball, the Jets brought in C.J. Mosley, who they expect to be the quarterback of their defense, if you will. They signed him to a nice, big, hefty contract. So again, that somewhat mirrors the Buffalo Bills approach. We were hoping Tremaine Edmonds can be that guy for us. And it starts to feel like the core pieces are in place for this Jets team. Uh, They definitely still have some areas where they need improvement, in particular on the defensive side of the ball. And especially at some particular positions, which I'm about to talk about as we move on. uh, We're going to talk now about uh, what I think the three keys to the Buffalo Bills securing a victory in this game are. And that's what I'm going to do every week. I'm going to give you three keys to the Bills securing a victory in the upcoming game. And to start, the number one key to victory against the New York Jets is we are going to have to hit some uh, fairly big chunk passing plays against this underwhelming Jets defense. Uh, At the cornerback position, the Jets have one of the weaker roster groups in probably all of the NFL Uh, Their number one cornerback, Tremaine Johnson, who they signed to a pretty big contract last offseason, really struggled in his first year with the New York Jets. He was suffering through an injury for most of the season. It seemed like he got into Todd Bowles' doghouse down the stretch last year. Now, so far in the preseason, he's been suffering through a hamstring injury, so he's still a little banged up. Uh, There could be an expectation then that he comes out a little rusty as he irons out the kinks, hasn't been able to practice as much as he would desire to. And he just has not looked like the same cornerback that we saw early in his career with the New York Rams. He may have lost some speed. And after Johnson in this cornerback group, it gets even more thin. First of all, they have relatively nondescript Daryl Roberts as their second cornerback. In the slot, they have Brian Poole, who's a try-hard player who came over from that Atlanta Falcons team. He was a surprise contributor when they made that Super Bowl run a few years back, but definitely not the most physically talented player. Now, new New York Jets general manager Joe Douglas clearly did not have too much faith in this cornerback group as he went out and made a trade early in his tenure here to acquire Nate Hairston, a cornerback who had a pretty good season for the Indianapolis Colts in the nickel last year. Uh, But obviously the Colts didn't think that highly of him if they've traded him away after one season. So this is this is a very weak cornerback group. They do have two very solid safeties in Jamal Adams and Marcus May, provided May stays healthy. And then another weakness of this Jets defense is that outside pass rush. They have a nice try-hard player in Jordan Jenkins who gets you about five to seven sacks a year, but he's definitely not a dynamic type pass rusher. They tried to fill this need uh, in the draft this year by selecting a Florida pass rusher, Ja'Kai Polite, in the third round. He quickly got into the coach's doghouse. He was fined quite often for missing meetings. He wasn't really producing on the field, so he's no longer on the team. The other starting outside pass rusher would have been Brandon Copeland, but he's suspended to begin the year, so he won't dress for this game. So you start to see a recipe here for the Bills to hit some big chunk plays with no outside pass rush and an underwhelming cornerback group. Uh, It does present a really big opportunity here for the Bills. Of course, we brought in John Brown, who can absolutely fly down that field. And we know all about Josh Allen's arm strength, but he's going to have to hit those plays. There's probably going to be opportunities with some open men down the field. And we're going to see pretty quickly if Josh Allen can capitalize with some accuracy on those deep throws. I think we started to see him do it more often down the stretch last year, in particular with Robert Foster as his main target. And that is going to be a very important key to victory in this game, to get a few of those big plays and put up some points. Now, I will say that the interior of that Jets defensive line is very impressive. 
Now, they drafted Quinnen Williams out of Alabama this year in the draft, who was my number one ranked player in the draft. Even though he's a rookie, I think he can be a pretty disruptive force. And then beside Quinnen Williams, they have a, another pretty solid interior player in the big cat, Leonard Williams. So that interior of the defensive line for the Jets is going to be a matchup to watch. Of course, we have Mitch Morse coming back, but he might be a little rusty. I think our whole offensive line together is uh, fairly new with each other, so they it may take time for them to gel. But uh, frankly, if we don't do a good job of containing the interior of that defensive line, we know that interior pass rush can really take over a game and get a, our young quarterback flustered. And it's likely if Josh Allen gets flustered in that pocket, his, still his first instinct is to leave the pocket and start running and then the Jets can really key in on that. And I don't think this type of scenario would lead to the best outcome for the Bills. So that will be a factor as well. But I think we're going to have some opportunities to hit some big plays down the field here. And we really have to capitalize on that. Uh, which actually brings up some fantasy advice in terms of John Brown. Uh, Brown is a very frustrating player for me in the fantasy world. Because I find if he doesn't hit one of those long touchdown passes, he ends up being a fantasy bust for the week. Uh, but I would recommend starting John Brown this week. I really have a good feeling against this Jets secondary that the Bills are going to try to capitalize some with some uh, longer plays. And I think John Brown has a good chance to be the recipient of those plays. And obviously this advice is probably more suitable for maybe 14 team leagues, maybe not a 10 team league. But if you have a tough flex decision and you want to take a risk on somebody who you think is more of a boomer bust prospect and you're hoping they score a touchdown or get some big chunk plays, I think John Brown is a very good chance to take this week against the Jets. Now my second key to victory, and this one should come to no surprise at all, is that we have to find a way to contain Le'Veon Bell. Now we saw what Le'Veon Bell can do in Pittsburgh. He's a jack of all trades running back. He's probably the best receiving running back in the league. He's also got great rushing skills. He's very patient. He's a one-cut zone type runner. And we talked about how the Jets improved the interior of that offensive line this year. So they're really setting themselves up to use Le'Veon Bell in many different facets this year. And he's going to be a key component to their offensive game planning. I expect him to get fed the ball in a variety of ways. Uh, interesting to note that behind Le'Veon Bell, they also have two other very solid pass receiving running backs in Ty Montgomery and Bilal Powell. And then you look at the new head coach, Adam Gase. Gase lived off the short passing game when he was head coach of Miami, consistently finding ways to get the balls into uh, Jarvis Landry's hands. Uh, we should expect the same here, and he's probably going to do the same with the bevy of pass catching running backs that he has here. But the most important one figures to be Le'Veon Bell. I don't think you have to stop him, but you just have to contain him and don't let him take over the game. Now, in the preseason, I was very impressed with the Buffalo Bills' run fits throughout the preseason. I think that front seven did a really good job in staying patient and clogging up run lanes. I'm very intrigued and excited about what I saw from Tremaine Edmonds. I think he's going to take even another step forward this year. And in the middle of the defensive line, Star Lutulale is a key cog and an underrated cog. So I think we do match up well. We do have the pieces in place in that front seven to contain Le'Veon Bell to a certain extent. It is worthwhile to note that the Jets will be without their starting tight end, Chris Herndon, who's suspended for the first four games of the season. Uh, Adam Gase really likes to get his tight ends involved in the passing game. We saw back when he was with Denver that Julius Thomas had really big years under him. That extended to Chicago where Gase targeted his tight ends quite a bit as well. So without Herndon and without any real dynamic replacement for him, I think it's just going to mean that he's going to even try to use Le'Veon Bell more than he would normally. Now while I have my reservations about Adam Gase as a person, to me he comes off a little bit uh, arrogant and cocky. I will say that he is a very smart offensive mind. And I think what you should expect to see from Gase is he tries to exploit matchups. He tries to get his best offensive players in isolated situations. Uh, he's known to use the uh, what's called the YSO formation where he puts three wide receivers on one side of the field to get the uh, fourth wide receiver, typically the tight end, isolated on the other side. He'll like to get his short area quickness guys and guys who are good running after the catch isolated on linebackers. And I think we'll see a lot of that with Le'Veon Bell and maybe some Ty Montgomery mixed in there as well. Now we have Sean McDermott to counter Adam Gates, who's a brilliant defensive mind. And we might see a bit of a chess match throughout this game between these two head coaches. We will probably see some adjustments throughout the game as Gates tries to get uh, his best players in a position to make plays. 
But I believe uh, after Le'Veon Bell that there, there's a bit of a talent drop off on this offense. And I think stopping him will be a major key for the Bills to secure a victory here. Now for the third key to victory. And both of these teams have their issues in certain respects on special teams. So I really think the team that fucks up the least on special teams is likely going to come out as the winner of this football game. I've spoken frequently about my concern about the punting situation here in Buffalo. As of the recording of this podcast, we are still going into the season with Corey Burroughs as our punter. And frankly, I'm fairly timid and nervous about that. Uh, we saw last year there were a few plays that really cost us, especially early, early in the season. Some botched snaps, some underwhelming punts. And then in the kicking game as well, we did have some struggles. Uh, late last year, uh, Stephen Hoshka struggled with his accuracy after a December injury. And that extended to early in this preseason as well. So I'm concerned. Uh, obviously, the Bills front office is not as concerned as they signed Stephen Hoshka to that contract extension. But I think we all know how important special teams is to deciding outcomes of the game. And I'm nervous about the Bills' situation. But on the other side of the ball, the New York Jets also have their special teams' concerns. Uh, Their kicking game is especially pretty shaky. This is a significant change from last year when they had Jason Myers. But since they let him go, they've had a bit of a carousel of kickers coming in here. Just this week, they claimed Corey Vedvik off waivers from the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Some of you may recall that he was the... Jack of all trades, kicker slash punter who the Vikings had traded for. Uh, He underachieved in the preseason and did not win that kicking job. And he's very unproven. So uh, the Jets are at risk for a some kind of fuck up in this game as well in the special teams game. Another interesting storyline in the special teams game is, of course, the Bills signed Andre Roberts, the kick returner who played for the New York Jets last year and burnt us. He basically took over a game in December last year and won the game for the Jets with some quite a few huge returns. And now the roles are reversed, and I would not be surprised to see Andre Roberts have a big return or two against his former team. Players always like to pick it up a little against their former teams, and especially when it's a divisional game. Now, I should note that Andre Roberts is a new addition to our injury report as of this Wednesday. He's suffering from a quad injury, so there is a chance that he doesn't suit up this Sunday. That would be fairly unfortunate, considering it is his former team. But regardless, I think that winning the special teams game and uh, having less fuck-ups than the Jets is going to be one key element to the game this Sunday. Special teams is always so important, and it's going to be especially important this game, uh, with both teams having uh, shaky areas of their special teams. So if we can avoid mistakes in the punting game, uh, hit our field goals, maybe get some big returns, and vice versa. If the the Jets have struggles in the kicking game and give up some big returns, that's going to be a huge help in this football game for us. All right, so moving on, uh, like I mentioned, uh, what I want to do every week is give a predicted score for the game ahead. Again, the Jets are favored by three at home. Uh, The over-under in this game, uh, as it currently stands, is 40 And so when I predict these weekly scores, I'm going to try my hardest not to be a homer. I'm going to try to be as objective as possible and use my head and not my heart, as hard as that is. But all that being said, I really do see the Bills winning this football game. Like I mentioned, I think we're going to have some opportunities to make some big chunk plays against this very underwhelming Jets secondary and almost non-existent outside pass rush. Now, I do expect Adam Gase to get creative, and I also expect that Greg Williams is going to give us some exotic looks to try to compensate for the talent deficiencies on that defense. But I think over four quarters, we're just going to have too many opportunities to hit some big chunk plays down the field. And I think if Josh Allen can capitalize on those big plays, I see a Bills victory, and I think that we are going to score some points in this game. So I'm going to go with a 27-20 to 20 Buffalo Bills victory over the New York Jets. And I envision the Bills going on the road and winning that first football game of the season, getting a nice divisional win, and it'll be a great start to this 2019 season. Now I say all this, but I'm still only cautiously optimistic. I still think this is a good young Jets team, and they're going to be fighting for their lives. They have a pretty tough early schedule, so this is a very important game for them. Of course, if they get that interior pressure and can fluster our young quarterback, Josh Allen, into making mistakes, that'll be a big feat for them in terms of putting themselves in a position to win the game. 
They will be at home, so if they do get off to an early lead, that will help them as well. Uh, but all things considered, I really do think that the Bills have a really good chance to win this game. And I cannot wait to find out how it all plays out this Sunday afternoon. And with that, we are going to wrap up what is the inaugural episode of the Build Up Podcast. Hope you guys all enjoy the game this Sunday afternoon. I've been saying this for a while, but football is finally actually back. If you're tailgating, have fun out there. Have a few beers for me. Uh, You probably won't have to because I'm sure I'll have a few beers as well. If they lose, I'm sure I'll be drowning my sorrows. And if they win, I'm sure I'll be celebrating. Uh, So until next week, go Buffalo Bills.